A cruise ship encounters a tsunami in the middle of the ocean. 2,000 tourists struggle to survive, but find themselves trapped on the ship underwater. Start swimming! Hold on, baby! Hold on! The enormous cruise ship Poseidon is sailing the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Among the tourists is a young couple, Jennifer and Christian. They are cuddling, chatting affectionately and preparing for some important event. Suddenly Jennifer's father, a strict man named Robert, enters the cabin. The lovers immediately pull away from each other so as not to annoy Robert. The man nonetheless lectures his daughter on her behavior with boys. Annoyed, Jennifer jumps up and runs away. Robert has no idea how his relationship with his daughter will change in the near future. A Hispanic woman named Elena wanders around the ship. She appears lost and looks for the kitchen, even though passengers are not allowed to go there. At the kitchen, she meets her boyfriend, a waiter named Marco. He scolds the girl for not staying in the cabin like he asked. Then he relents and gives Elena some food. So why does Elena have to hide? Maybe she is a criminal. In the evening, all the passengers dress up and come to a New Year's Eve dinner party. The captain congratulates those gathered on the coming holiday, and a concert begins. The guests rejoice and dance. Robert goes to the casino and loses a large sum to a man named Dylan. Dylan goes to collect his winnings and accidentally bumps into a boy playing a PSP. While they are picking up the scattered pieces, the boy's mother, a beautiful woman named Maggie, comes up to them. The woman flirts with Dylan and hints that she has no husband. After exchanging pleasantries, they go their separate ways, pleased with each other. An architect named Richard is getting drunk and tells his friends that he has broken up with his girlfriend. It's New Year's Eve. The party is in full swing. Balloons and confetti are flying at the guests. At that moment, the senior officer in the deckhouse senses an unusual vibration. He notices something scary through his binoculars and quickly gives the order. No. Richard, suffering from an unrequited love, goes out on deck and is about to end his life. But then he sees a huge wave on the horizon, which is fast approaching the Poseidon. He is frightened and returns to the banquet hall. Meanwhile, the crew in the control room unsuccessfully tries to turn the ship to the right to tackle the wave with the bow of the ship. The wave, however, is moving too fast. The sailors manage to sound an all-out alarm. Passengers panic and scurry around the ship. The tsunami comes crashing down on the ship with a terrible roar. All hell breaks loose inside the Poseidon. The ship begins to overturn under the force of the water. The passengers are hit by the furniture and pieces of the ship. Many fall from great heights. As a result, the Poseidon is turned upside down. All of the officers in the deckhouse and the rest of the crew drown and pass away. Only those in the banquet hall manage to survive. The emergency lighting is turned on. People try to recover and put out a fire. Jean and Christian have been clubbing in the next section the whole time. And now Chris's leg is pinned by a metal frame, and Jean is desperately trying to get him out. She gets help from Elena, the Hispanic woman. In the banquet hall, Maggie can barely find her son Connor. The boy is stuck under the ceiling and is crying in fear. Robert comes to the rescue of the screaming Maggie. He used to work as a fireman, so he helps the boy down safely. The captain makes a speech to reassure the passengers. Is that we were struck by what is known as a rogue wave. But here's the good news. The ship's GPS beacons are automatically turned on. This means that help will be arriving in a few hours. The captain asks everyone to stay in the room and not panic. He declares that as long as all the doors are hermetically sealed, the liner will float like a bubble. Frightened, Robert still plans to go to the next section in search of his daughter. Dylan, too, thinks he should go upstairs and get out through the spiral vents in the bottom of the ship. Maggie and her son, Robert and the architect Richard try to follow him. But Dylan is not thrilled with their company. He is used to acting alone. To make himself credible, Robert finds a guide, Marco the waiter, who somehow knows the ship and can lead everyone upstairs. Then Dylan relents and agrees to act together. The company makes their way out of the banquet hall. The captain immediately orders that the door be sealed behind them so that the surviving passengers will remain safe. The group, led by Dylan, find the elevator and want to use the shaft to get to the top. They unlock the doors and use a makeshift bridge to get to the other side of the shaft. If they get to the top, they can reach the section with the club. Everyone helps each other across. But you have to hurry, because the elevator car is stuck at the top of the shaft and is about to go down. Richard and Marco are the last ones left. While they are climbing out, the elevator starts coming down. Richard has to shove Marco off to get out himself. Hey, come off! I'm sorry. The elevator falls to the bottom of the shaft and a huge explosion occurs. The group manages to close the door behind them and escape the fire. Richard is very sorry for what happened to Marco, but there is nothing more he can do to help him. The company heads to the section with the club. All along, Jean and Elena have been trying to free Chris's leg from under the metal frame. Another survivor, a man with the nickname Lucky Larry, comes to the girl's aid. Lifting the metal with a lever, they finally free Chris. Immediately afterwards, Robert runs into the hall. Father and daughter are reunited and embrace. The girls administer first aid to Chris, and the crying Elena forms a friendship with Richard. The girl confides in him and tells her story. 
She urgently needed to get to New York to see her brother, but she had no money for a ticket. So Elena started sleeping with Marco the waiter to get on the ship. Richard listens sympathetically to her and has no idea that Marco is the same waiter he shoved down the elevator shaft. Robert and Dylan find the door upstairs. It's red hot from the fire, but the men manage to open it. Elena takes a closer look at Robert and realizes that he is the former mayor of New York. The poor stowaway never expected to be in such company. The team enters the lobby. Now they have to walk over a precipice to get to the next section. A piece of wreckage has fallen between the two sides of the lobby. It can be traversed like a bridge. Chris goes first to test the structure's strength. The others also take turns crossing to the other side over the wreckage of the liner. People willingly help each other. Richard helps Elena, who is afraid of heights. Only lucky Larry gets drunk and insults Robert. According to him, Robert has failed as mayor of New York and is generally a failure in life. If I recall correctly, you couldn't even hang on to your wife. Robert is about to come at him with his fists, but Jean asks her father to be wiser. So the man only laughs at the drunken scoundrel. Larry defiantly jumps onto the bridge, not about to let Jennifer pass in front of him. The guy brags about his luck and climbs up the bridge. Suddenly, a huge engine falls on the exuberant Larry from the ceiling. The bridge collapses and Larry goes under the water along with it. Immediately, fuel starts dripping from the ceiling. It ignites instantly and there is a terrible explosion. Miraculously, the group manages to escape the fire. After the explosion, Robert offers to go back and find another way to the rest of the crew, as there is no longer a bridge to the other side. But Dylan does not agree to go back and defies Robert. Jean's father tries to steer her in a different direction, but she screams that she's not a little girl anymore and can make up her own mind. The girl wants to be reunited with her boyfriend by all means. She admits to her father that Chris proposed to her and shows him the ring. This is the very secret she has long been afraid to tell Robert. He is not happy, but accepts his daughter's decision. Meanwhile, Dylan finds a fire hose and jumps into the water with the burning fuel. The guy swims under the fire to the other side of the lobby and climbs to the other side. There, Dylan fastens the sturdy hose and prompts Robert and his daughter to use it to get to the other side of the lobby. Jean embraces her fiancé and Robert, thanks the brave Dylan for the idea with the hose. Meanwhile, a porthole in the banquet hall bursts because of the enormous water pressure. People are horrified and run around the room, trying to plug the cracks where the water is coming from. Only the captain remains calm. He embraces his sweetheart and awaits his last moments. The water shatters the windows and floods the room. Everyone left in the banquet hall passes away without a chance to get out. The survivors see that something terrible has happened. They have no idea if they'll survive until rescue workers arrive, but they continue on their way up. Now all the lower compartments of the Poseidon are rapidly filling with water. The group is running through the corridors in a panic, but all the passageways are already flooded. Finding no other way out, they decide to use the ventilation duct to get to the top. Robert crawls first and sees a vertical shaft ahead. It is the only way to escape, so the group follows him. Below, Elena hysterically refuses to climb the shaft, because she is afraid of confined spaces. Dylan then forcibly drags the girl inside. Upon reaching the exit at the top, Robert realizes that the grate is barred. It is held in place by a bolt fastened from the outside. There is no way to reach it and no way to break the bars. At this point, Richard gets stuck in the lower curve of the pipe and can't move. Elena, who is crawling after him, has a severe claustrophobic attack. She cannot push Richard forward, crying and screaming. Dylan crawls after the distraught Elena. He feels the water coming in from below, and tries to calm Elena down. After all, he will drown if he can't make the girl move forward. Dylan tries to think of anything that will help, and he reminds Elena of her ailing brother in New York City. To finally cheer the girl up, Dylan promises. Yeah, I promise! I promise you'll see him just reach out! Finally Elena calms down and shoves Richard through. The company continues to move upward, but the lattice still won't budge. Only little Connor can reach the screw. With the help of Elena's cross, the child unscrews the bolt. The friends then push the grate out and escape the vent. The company enters a new chamber. There is only one door leading out of it, closed from the outside. And the water is coming up faster and faster, and the group urgently need to act. They climb into the compartment where the water comes in. There is only one way out, but it can't be opened by hand. There's only one way to get through. How? By flooding this entire tank. Everyone is horrified at the idea of flooding the compartment, but there's not much else to do. Dylan tries to reassure his companions and promises that the valve will definitely open and the water will carry them to the next tank. Robert interrupts everyone's hysteria and commands Dylan to open the airlock. Everyone gathers around the valve. The water quickly fills the room. People already have no room to breathe, and the hatch to the next compartment is still closed. Dylan is terrified, because if his idea doesn't work, the whole company will be lost because of him. 
but the escape hatch does open. Under the pressure of the water, people swim out into the next compartment, but it is impossible to stay here for a long time, because it is also flooded. Then Dylan dives in and finds the next door. Everyone has to hold their breath and swim after Dylan to the exit. Chris volunteers to help ferry Connor on top of him. Everyone dives under the water and swims after the leader, shining flashlights at themselves. Most of the company manages to make it safely to a safer spot. Richard and Elena are swimming last. Suddenly the girl's clothes get caught in a cable and she can't swim any further. She thrashes in a panic, hitting her head and losing consciousness. Richard goes back and tries to save her. The other worried men swim to his rescue. They manage to carry Elena to safety. Robert immediately gives her CPR and tries to restart her heart, but all is useless, the girl no longer regains consciousness. Richard has managed to bond with Elena and now painfully suffers her loss. The others are also in shock and cry. The friends put her cross on top of the girl and continue moving on. After all, the water has already reached this compartment. The group climbs a ladder and enters the cargo hold. They hear a strange knocking sound outside the ship and hope it's the rescuers. They quickly clear away the stuff and get to the wall. But it turns out to be a telephone receiver banging against the iron frame. The frustrated team makes their way down the next corridor. Here they find a map of the ship's compartments. Dylan suggests getting out through the bow of the ship, for that is where the propeller compartment that leads to the outside is located. The friends regain hope and run to the bow of the Poseidon. All right, let's go. Let's go. That's our way out. But it turns out that the bow has gone underwater. The exit openings are also flooded and there's no way to swim to them. No one knows what to do next. The group decides to return to the unsubmerged part of the ship. But Dylan stares at the submerged bow as if mesmerized. It was the only way to escape. What awaits the company of survivors now? The friends split into pairs and try to look for other exits. But, having found nothing, they get desperate and gather together in one of the cabins. Connor runs off somewhere, and Maggie goes looking for him. At that moment, several powerful explosions occur aboard the liner. Due to this, the bow of the ship floats up. The water begins to flood the stern, where the group is located. Under Robert's leadership, the friends quickly run to the bow. But the brave Dylan cannot leave Maggie and Connor, who are lost somewhere. He goes in search of the mother and child. Soon Dylan finds the crying woman and tries to calm her down. In one of the corridors, they hear Connor's voice. The boy is stuck behind some kind of grate. The room quickly fills with water, and getting the boy out is not easy. Maggie emotionally interacts with her son through the bars and begs him to stay on the surface. Meanwhile, Dylan keeps diving, looking for a way to rescue Connor. At one point they both disappear, and Maggie falls into despair. She sobs and thinks her son and Dylan are gone underwater. But soon they both emerge alive and unharmed. Everyone hugs happily and then heads to the bow of the ship, where the others have already gathered. Richard opens the hatch, behind which the engines rumble. The lid flies off abruptly and hurts him. It becomes clear, as long as the propellers are spinning, no one will be able to get out. The engine can only be shut down in the control room, but it is flooded with water. Swimming there is a one-way trip. Robert is about to take his chances, but Jean hugs him and begs him to stay. However, he refuses to listen to her. Christian then volunteers to swim to the control panel, because he is more resilient and has a better chance of success. Jean realizes that she will never see her boyfriend again, and begins to sob. Christian touchingly bids farewell to Jennifer, who is not at all ready to let him go. Baby, I need you to tell me that you love me. While the lovers process their tragedy, Robert can't bear to watch his daughter cry and sneaks off to the control room himself. He barely makes it to the control panel. It turns out that the engine shutdown button is broken. Robert, terrified, probes all the buttons on the console, but none of them work. The man runs out of air and convulses. It turns out that he sacrificed himself in vain. In the last seconds of his life, Robert manages to press the reverse button. The propellers will now spin in reverse. At this point, Dylan, along with Maggie and Connor, arrive at the bow of the ship and learn what is happening. Dylan admires Robert's latest feat. If they throw debris on the propellers, they'll jam. Then they can get past them. Dylan throws a can of gas into the engine compartment, but it gets stuck in the hole. Then, putting himself at risk, he pushes the cylinder further into the compartment. There's a huge explosion. The propellers stop. Jean looks somberly into the water and says goodbye to her hero father. All of the survivors walk past the propellers and finally make their way to freedom. Behind them, another explosion is heard. The group jump into the water and swim to the nearest inflatable dinghy. The Poseidon flips over and could fall right onto the dinghy. So the friends desperately paddle their oars and pull away. Meanwhile, the Poseidon turns upside down and then goes underwater for good. The friends look on in horror and cannot believe they will be saved. Dylan finds a flare in the boat and fires it into the air. At first nothing happens, but soon two helicopters and several ships arrive at the light of the flare. They received the SOS signal and finally found the survivors from the wreck of the majestic Poseidon. What was the most unusual New Year's Eve in your life? Share your experiences in the comments and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss our new videos. See you soon.